I invite you to remain standing and to turn to page 12 in your hymnal. It's the very front, the very small letters at the top of the page. It's the invitation, confession, and pardon as we are coming to the table of communion today. Christ our Lord invites to this table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, can let us confess our sin before God and with one another. Merciful God, confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to a moment of silent confession and prayer. Hear this good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The scripture for this day, as you remain standing in honor and respect of the gospel, is from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. I invite you to turn in your Bible there, and if you don't have your Bible with you, there is one in the pew back in front of you. Hear now the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. This is the word of God for you and me, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated, and as you are, let us bow together in prayer. Awaken us, O God, to the presence of your Spirit, which has always been our comfort and our guide. May that Spirit stand now between me and your people so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together would be shaped, formed, and molded into the gospel of Christ, in whose name we pray, in whose name we have gathered, and in whose name we will seek to depart this place and represent your love in Christ to all. And all of God's people did say, Amen. The Christmas season is not just a season of joyful noises and wonderful scents and aromas. There are for many a difficult time in this season of Advent approaching Christmas, and there's a darkness that people walk in in various ways, whether it be from memories or from habits or from walking a path that's broken and jagged. But even amidst the darkness of the larger world in our own individual journeys, we hear and gather around this good news that the darkness cannot overcome the light. In Christmas of 1968, Gerald Coffey was spending his third Christmas in prison in what historically we know and affectionately call the Hanoi Hilton. He was a POW in Vietnam. You can read about his spectacular life, and I would greatly encourage you to do so at CaptainCoffee.com. Coffee just like coffee. CaptainCoffee.com. Jerry, Captain Jerry as he was known. And it was in December of 1968, in that third year he was there, it was his third Christmas, that some guards brought to him some candy. That was all he had that Christmas, and he unwrapped the candy in the prison. He later writes these words. 
In that place, there was nothing to distract me from the awesomeness of Christmas, even though I'd lost everything that defined who I was. I continued to find strength within. I realized that although I was hurting and lonely and scared, this might be the most significant Christmas of my life. This might be the most significant Christmas of my life. In the midst of that very dark place, Captain Coffee found a way to lean upon his faith. And the narrative that we know of Christmas and the Christmas story to bring him hope. And though our circumstances are far different, each of us probably struggles in differing kinds of ways with that moment of darkness. In seminary at Duke, we were quizzing Dr. Steinmetz, who was a professor of Christian history. And the joke was that he would preach when he lectured, and when he tried to preach in chapel, he lectured. And we were asking him with his magnificent grasp of church history and being an author of the Reformation and Martin Luther, could he give us a contemporary expression of what it means to understand that God's light has come into this world? Now, Dr. Steinmetz was my advisor. There weren't a lot of us from Texas, so we stood out a bit. We didn't sound quite like the North Carolina draw. And those of us who were from Texas who were not introverts stood out even more than others. I was one of those found out one day that he did not like the song Kumbaya. And so as a way of teasing him, I began humming it in class when he walked in. He stopped and he looked at me, looked over his glasses, and all he did was this. So the question came about how do you understand historically the grand concept of the revelation of God, God's revealing God's self to all of us in the midst of the journey that sometimes is in shadow, sometimes in darkness. How do we know what God wants of us? How does God's light shine into our lives? He said, well, Palmer, and you know when a professor calls you just by last name, you want that relationship to be as sterile as possible on your end as a student. And I simply said, yes, sir. You're from Texas, right? Yes, sir. Didn't know where this was going. Then a profound question came. You've got cows in Texas, right? Yes, sir, we have cows in Texas, lots of them. And then he began to describe, he said, well, this may be a bit crude, but imagine, if you would, that you're standing at the edge of this pasture through which a drove of cows have come. Now, only seminary professors will you drove and cows in the same sentence, unless you're saying, I drove my cow to market. He said, it's pitch dark, but there's a thunderstorm, and all these cattle have come through. He said, but suddenly there is a flash of lightning, and you can see what is in front of you and where you should step and where you should not step you will get a bit messy if you go further than what you have seen and can remember. And that is a very simplistic but beautiful way because I find myself at times wondering, well, God, well, how is this going to play out? How are we going to work this out? What's it going to look like in the next three months, six months, 12 months, two years? God, where's this going? And then I really, in my heart of hearts, I wish that God would say, well, let me give you a little clip here. Here's the whole picture. Here's how it's all going to work out. Here's all the details. But it doesn't work like that. You, you get a little bit, and then if you try to go further than what you have heard and studied and God's Spirit spoken to you from others, you tend to step in stuff when you try to go further than where you've seen and heard God's light shine into your life. We hear this passage today, and it's very simple. The simple word is, the darkness cannot overcome the light. And that's why we gather. That's why we tell the same story. 
And as we lean into the Gospel of John, we find none of the characters that are familiar to pageants. The Gospel of John has no birth narrative, no nativity. There's no shepherds, no star, no manger. There's no Mary, there's no Joseph. There's just the essence of how this all began in the beginning. And in the Gospel of John, much of it is written in what I call the Dr. Seuss format. I could only read a couple of the books to our kids from the Dr. Seuss. I couldn't always read the letters because they would, you just want to override. You have to memorize. The one phrase I sticks with me because it took so long to memorize was, through three cheese trees, a breezy breeze blew. Because when you read that, it just doesn't alliterate the way you think it should. And sometimes in the Gospel of John, there's this alliteration that can move either forwards or backwards. And you can read from one verse and read in reverse order or in chronological order of the verses, and the meaning stays the same. I want to approach this in reverse order as we approach the table. The great good news and the culmination at the end of this journey, which is also where we're going to arrive, is that the darkness cannot, will not overcome the light of Christ. Jesus goes on to say in John chapter 12, verse 46, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me should not remain in darkness. So we understand that God's coming to us in this Christ child, coming to us in the earthly journey, the word made flesh, this light of life. The purpose of this is that you and I would move from the darkness, from the shadows and walk in the light. And as you move in reverse order through this text, in verses 4, 3, and 2, you find great pro- three great proclamations. The first is that the life of Christ is the light of the world. Verse 4 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of all people. And not only is the life of Christ the light of the world, that life is the light that created all things. Verse 3 says that all things came into being through him and without him. Not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life. And verse 2 says that this life is the light of God. Specifically with these words, he was in the beginning with God. And so we arrive at the very place of ending or beginning and how we read these five verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And while this may seem as just a poetic alliteration, it's terribly important for us to understand the core essence of our theological understanding of who God is and who Christ is. Who is this one cradled in Mary's arms, the Messiah, the King of Kings, Emmanuel, God with us? The word was with God means that they are distinct persons and can fellowship with one another. But the word was God means that they are one God, not two. And so we hold fast on the journey to Bethlehem of this biblical mystery. God the Father and God the Son have such a unity that they are one God, not two, and such distinction that they are two persons, not one. And it is into this light of life that we are welcomed to the table. I think the best way to illustrate in a practical way quite differently from Professor Steinmetz of how the light radiates into our lives is simply from our home. When we purchased the home that we did in Amarillo, we had one day to find a house. The house that caught our attention had this magnificent porch across most of the back part of the house, had a built-in fireplace, had a place to slide in a refrigerator, had a sink, had a grill built in, and we thought, this is wonderful. This will be fantastic. We'll be out here all the time in Amarillo on the back porch. (laughs) Yeah, no one laughed like that for us when we were looking. (laughs) We got here and found out that, you know, it was most of the time maybe too windy. And then when it wasn't windy, all the flies would show up. And if the flies weren't around, it's because they went back to the smell that lingered on the back porch. And then in the winter months, the snow would build in, and 
We enclosed that back porch, and so it is wonderful now that it is out of the elements to go out of the back porch to raise up the solar shades in the winter. And while it may be 15 degrees outside with 30 mile an hour winds, and by the way, the dust still blows in your face, I like to tell people, Amarillo, the only place you can be knee deep in snow and the dust will still blow in your face. <laughs> I like to sit in the chair as the sun rises or in the middle part of the afternoon. And no matter how cold and blustery it may be outside, the radiance of the sun warms the porch. You can literally feel it on your skin. You know what this is like. You can sit in your car in Amarillo on a single digit day, and if there are no clouds in the sky, still need your air conditioner to cool off the car in winter. There's something powerful about the radiance of the sun, and there's also something very powerful about the radiant presence of the sun that we celebrate this day in the bread of life, the Son of God. So we're all welcome today. Come bask in the presence of the one cradled in Mary's arms, and where your faith feels cold, may his radiant love warm your life. Where you are stubbing your toes in darkness and shadows, pause and let the light of Christ, the light of life, illuminate your journey. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may it be true for each of us. And all of God's people did say, Amen.